This is one of my all-time favorite cartoon sounds. If you're not familiar, it's Charlie Brown's teacher droning on, his classmates nodding off. It's so good because we've all been there, sitting in class, struggling to stay awake. <laughs> Suddenly, you find yourself in dreamland. And things get weird. All rise. A dolphin. In a courtroom, this is not my usual stress dream. In 1972, an American law professor had enough. His students were falling asleep during one of his classes, and he wanted to propose something different for them to wake up. And he said, do you guys think that we should give trees some standings and nature some rights? (laughs) Hang on, hang on. Nature being given its own legal rights in a courtroom. The students woke up. And it started a debate which has gone to the US Supreme Court and around the world. Now it's coming into your ears. Because if nature had rights and could maybe sue us, it's not a stretch to think we'd be in front of a judge. Having to answer for, say, the forests we're cutting down. Or the fossil fuels we're burning. From the BBC World Service, this is The Climate Question with Kate Lamble and Neil Rizal asking, could giving nature rights help fight climate change? The professor in our story was Christopher Stone. He died earlier this year, but his thought experiment, designed to jolt students out of their stupor, became a landmark paper called Should Trees Have Standing? Standing in this context means a strong enough connection to a case to be heard in court. Here's Professor Stone talking about the idea in 2013. People like the idea that we should be speaking for nature, that nature should have its own voice and when they understood, even though nature can speak, corporations can speak, nation states can speak, they hire someone, they have a council to speak for them. While some grasp the idea immediately, it's taken decades for it to sink in in other places. It's an idea that is hard, especially for lawyers. Natalia Green is steeped in this story. She's the coordinator of the Global Alliance for the Rights of Nature. Her kid's cat, Jimmy Cherry, kept her company during her interview with us. We've met a lot of lawyers who say, you know, in law school 101, the first thing that I was taught was that a subject of rights is an individual, a corporation, but not nature. But of course, law evolves. Yeah, the cat sitting with you previously wouldn't have had rights, and in many jurisdictions, animals now do have rights. Exactly. Now animals do have rights, and it's interesting because I think that rights of nature and rights of animals are very complementary. They're not the same. But yes, that has evolved. Law evolves all the time. It evolved, for example, to recognize that indigenous people have collective rights. It evolved with women, thanks God. It evolved with abolition of slavery. It evolved with animal rights. Now the climate crisis, with the biodiversity crisis, we need to make a law evolve to recognize that nature is a subject of rights. It's one thing to say animal rights are important. It's another to let Chimichurri take you to court. (laughs) Meow. So we're talking about something bigger. Let's see how this notion of giving nature rights has been working in practice. John DX Lapid is a journalist, lawyer, and one lucky guy. We spoke to him off the coast of the Philippines. Well, this is Tanyu Strait. We're traveling to uh, the municipality of uh, Luginsan, to the mainland. And in my left, I can see the green mangrove forest and on my right side, I can see the Canlaon volcano, one of the most active volcanoes in the Philippines. The wind is calm, the weather is gloomy, but it is still okay. The Tanyon Strait is famous for its wildlife. Two years ago, DX, as he's known, traveled through here with his daughters. And sure enough, dolphins swam right up to their boat. They're swimming with us. They're jumping with us. They're trying to play with us. That sounds so special. How did your daughters react to all the dolphins around them? Oh, they can't stop smiling. They can't stop uh, talking about it to their classmates. Now they really want to see again those dolphins. And they have a a small uh, sister, my youngest. But uh, she was still in the tummy of her mommy when we visited uh, Ba'i City. So my two daughters, uh, they keep on uh, telling their younger sister about their experience. The dolphins have, at times, had less to smile about. And here's where the question of rights surface. In 2008, a Japanese company began exploring for oil in the Tanyon Strait. Fishermen in the area were kept from their traditional grounds, and the dolphins disappeared. 
It's thought they were scared off by the noise. It was big news in the Philippines. Lawyer Lisa Osorio remembers chatting about it with a colleague. We met for lunch and then he said, like, why don't you file a case in behalf of the dolphins and mammals of Tanyan Strait? So we were just laughing about it and then we were quite serious and said, OK, let's do this because uh, this is, I think, the right case for us to challenge the courts thinking about who will have a legal standing to sue in court, not only humans, but also non-human plaintiffs as well. The idea had never been tested in the Philippines. Some people made fun of it. And before the legal arguments could even begin, there was some awkward admin. They were actually ordered to pay the legal fees, the docket fees for the court. So the lawyer said, we can't pay because the mamas are actually poor. They don't have money. <laughs> but the Supreme Court said, no, you should pay. So hang on, what happens there? Like dolphins, don't, I mean, do courts accept krill as payment? Do, do they take seashells? How does this work? <laughs> no. Uh, so so the, the stewards actually paid the court fees, the docket fees. Stewards, a legal term for a person appointed to represent the dolphins. In this case, lawyer Lisa. It was quite funny because when they issued the receipt that this was paid by the resident marine mammals. And so we still have a copy of that receipt that up to this day because we thought that, well, that was a first victory for us. That, you know, the Supreme Court officially recognized the resident marine mammals as a person, right? Because that was what we were after. A dream come true. It took years, but in the end, the dolphins won. The oil company executives were ordered to feed them pails of wriggling fish. That part is not true. Ah, spoil sport. But that beautiful spot where DX is, it's the exact place where the drilling took place. Now, there's no sign it ever happened. If our boatman did not uh, tell me that this is actually the site where the oil drilling happened, I would not know. And he says the case set a precedent. Because of that case, they allowed people to become stewards of any animal, of any uh, natural resource. May it be a river, may it be a seascape like the Tanya Strait, may it be a whale or uh, the sardines in uh, Moalboal. So it's allowed in the Philippines that any creature be represented by human being, a steward. I mean, I have questions first. Is it really anyone who can put their hand up and be like, oh, oh, me, I'll be the steward of the sardines? Well, I like a challenge. I mean, have you not <laughs> seen film of billions of them flashing past the coast of South Africa? Sardines are amazing. But anyone wanting to be a steward has to have money for a legal case. We all know sea creatures are broke. Yeah, I'm feeling a bit like a sardine now. <laughs> and secondly, do we really know what the animals want? I mean, lots of humans vote for things that aren't particularly good for them. Are you suggesting some whales might secretly be pro-oil? <laughs> Come on, there's got to be one or two that are like, hang on, I just need to get my whale voice down. Surely it's good for the economy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like there's a whale in the room with me. I can't believe it. Um, you will be doing the rest of the program in that voice, by the way. Maybe not. Four years ago, the public gallery in New Zealand's parliament, packed with indigenous Maori people, broke into song. Lawmakers had just passed a bill that went further than the case in the Philippines. New Zealand had now recognised a river as a person. My name's Jacinta Ruru. I'm a professor of law at the University of Otago here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. This is a really neat solution in law, and this makes entire sense from a Māori perspective. Because from a Māori perspective, that river has always had personality. It has always been a person. The river and many rivers and mountains are our ancestors. Jacinta's talking about the Vanganui River. So the Whanganui River is this amazingly beautiful river here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's in the North Island. It's our third longest river. And it weaves its way from the mountains down to the sea.
You can see why they were singing when the river gained legal personality. So how does this personality behave in a legal context? So now there are two people who have been given the legislative mandate to speak on behalf of the river. One's been appointed by our government and the second person is appointed by the Māori tribal nation of this area. So two people now have the authority and the legal backing to speak on behalf of this river. It means now that we have a dedicated legal voice that positions the importance of the health and well-being of the river, not just for now, but to over generations to come. Professor Ruru says it's too early to say what the long-term impacts of this legal change will be. You can imagine it could help strengthen conservation efforts. So long as the two people appointed to speak on its behalf can agree and convince the court. Mm. But there are other consequences too. Think of flooding, which is likely to become more regular as the climate changes. And now that it is a legal person, it can potentially be sued, as all persons can be. Really? You could bring a suit against the river? The uh, river has all the rights and responsibilities and duties of a legal person. And so that must also entail the ability to be able to sue the river. OK, Neil, what sound effect should we use for that idea? <laughs> order! Order! What an interesting notion to be thinking about, particularly as the river damages property. But of course, the river itself doesn't hold money, so I'm not quite sure what damages it would be able to pay out. I suppose you could make it do hard time, turning the generators on a hydro dam. Interestingly, the decision to make the Fanganui a legal person was not motivated by conservation, but reconciliation. It was part of ongoing major negotiations between the government of New Zealand and the Maori. What they've come up with could have implications for climate change and a lot else. This solution, I think, is really positively disrupting notions of colonialism, colonial power, and even potentially capitalism. I think it's a really significant mind shift that is taking place. Crikey, disrupting capitalism. Is, is that allowed? Right? These are big thoughts. It's about thinking about nature as something other than someone's private property, something to be exploited. What if it's got its own interests that might have nothing to do with human beings? Nature, after all, was around for billions of years before we showed up. Indigenous laws and science and values have an enormous amount to offer to us as a country as we navigate real significant issues that our country is facing around climate change, biodiversity crisis and so on. So if you're interested in this, you can check out the Climate Questions back catalogue. We made a whole show about Indigenous knowledge earlier this year. New ideas are always welcome during times of great change. For Ecuador on the west coast of South America, that was the 2000s. There have been 10 presidents in 20 years. The vice president of Ecuador, Gustavo Noboa, has declared himself the country's new leader, apparently with the support of the military. The president of the South American Republic of Ecuador, Abdallah Bacaram, is refusing to leave the presidential palace, despite a parliamentary vote to depose him on the grounds of mental incompetence. While changing leaders like dirty shirts, Ecuador was also changing everything else. Its currency, its very system of government, everything was on the table. In 2007... The Constitutional Assembly members had an exercise that was called, what's the country you dream of? Let me guess, the dream was dolphins in a courtroom. Surprisingly, that didn't come up. (laughs) But Natalia Green had been hired to lobby lawmakers and she pitched an idea. Why not enshrine nature's rights in the country's founding legal document, the Constitution? That really would upend things. As with those dozing students in America, the idea took hold. The lawmakers drafted a document. A vote was scheduled. The day before, Natalia brought a group of indigenous shamans to the assembly. They held a ceremony to ask the spirit of nature to enlighten those who were going to take part in this important decision. To our surprise, in April 10th, 2008, the Assembly recognized that not only human beings, collectives and corporations have rights, but also nature is a subject of rights. 
Ecuador's constitution now states that Mother Earth, or Pachamama, has the right to respect for its existence and for the maintenance of its life cycles and evolutionary processes. Any Ecuadorian can call upon the public authorities to enforce the rights of nature. So we were extremely happy and celebrating that amazing victory. Is every politician happy with this? No. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> our president wasn't happy with it. He thought that it was something very, and I will say the exact word, very stupid. <laughs> it's hard for governments to be in favor of the rights of nature because that really questions what they're doing and how are they getting the money. Money comes from resources and resources come from nature. So money comes from minerals and from oil development. So it's hard to get politicians on the same mindset. Nature has had rights in Ecuador for more than 12 years now. Natalia has been tracking how the new constitution has been used by the courts. In more than 100 cases, she's counted more wins than losses. But not everyone believes giving nature rights is a quick fix. If we're looking for a tool which can take on the incredibly complicated issue of climate change, don't we need something more effective than it works some of the time? Jan Darpo is a professor of environmental law in Uppsala, Sweden. The European Union commissioned him to write a report about the rise of the rights of nature movement. He says the movement has some merit. First of all, it's about the climate. And second, it's about mass extinction of species. I think those two major environmental problems is at the core of the movement, and therefore the rights of nature is described as a recipe to solve those challenges. So it's a recipe to solve those challenges. That sounds like it's quite practical. You follow the steps, you carry it out, solved. Does it work like that? Uh, no. <laughs> 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 I, I, I don't think so. Ah. You didn't think it would be that easy, did you? Jan says advocates of the right to nature movement often cite the same cases again and again as proof that their approach works, without acknowledging the failures. Even some of the landmark cases in India, in Ecuador, actually has, at the end of the day, failed. In 2017, India awarded the Ganges and one of its tributaries the same rights as the Vanganui River in New Zealand. That judgment were actually quashed on appeal by the Indian Supreme Court, which is rarely mentioned in the rights of nature movement. And to me, as a legal scholar, it, that does not suffice. Natalia, in Ecuador, does accept implementation can be a big problem. After one successful case, the court allowed 30 years for a gas flare to be shut down. Other winds have floundered because those representing nature ran out of money to continue arguing on appeal. And some cases have been strung out for so long, the development they were trying to stop went ahead in the meantime. That is cases we call one in court but lost on the ground. Jan says the right to nature movement works better in some places than others. In the European Union, he says, it's not really necessary because there are already strong environmental protections. Right. And he has wider concerns. My concern is whether the rights of nature is a dead end when it comes to legal representation. What do you mean by dead end? I mean, I would not advocate a system where courts are inventing environmental protection. In a sense, they already do, but they do that under the laws, the laws created in a democratic order. He says that by enshrining the rights of nature above all, it risks overruling voters and elected officials. That aspect I strongly oppose because I think there needs to be public consensus when it comes to what kind of measures we need to take on behalf of, of the climate, for example. Is it always that rights of nature should be at the winning part when it comes to environmental decision making? You need to make balances. What he's saying is that these things are complicated. When we make decisions about the climate, we have to weigh up competing interests from many different groups of humans. And that's before you even start to look at how these decisions would impact different species. Exactly. Do ants have more or less rights than elephants? You can email your thoughts on that <laughs> or anything else to theclimatequestion at bbc.com. Natalia Green in Ecuador rejects the notion that the rights to nature movement oversimplifies things. What it's doing is pretty much making nature a stakeholder. And that is something that we haven't done before. Yeah, I mean, so often when it comes to climate change, the conversation eventually comes down to like a fundamental reassessment of our relationship with nature. It sounds like 
this law is a mechanism to do that, to kind of, in a crude way, kind of operationalize that reassessment. It certainly does. It's a mechanism that really jolts us from our daily normal interactions with the environment. If we can show to the nation that we have responsibilities of care for all that is around us, just as we have responsibilities of care for our own children and our grandchildren, I think that really does disrupt our conversations, our mindset, and it really places us in a really significant way back with nature. Giving nature legal rights began as a ruse to wake dozing law students. 50 years on, Lisa Osorio, who brought the Dolphins case in the Philippines, says it's now part of the curriculum. I always tell my students, uh, you have to read uh, their marine mammals case and Actually, it gives us hope with the effects of climate change being felt already by all of us. Giving nature rights, as we've seen, has enjoyed some real-world successes in the courtroom. It's not a cure-all for climate change or any other environmental issue. But who says it has to be? Maybe it's enough to be a big idea that nudges us all awake. <laughs> huh? all we have time for right now. Thank you to researcher Natasha Fernandez, to producer Darren Cram, to our series producer Roz Jones, and the man who makes it all sound so beautiful, James Beard. <laughs> 